to the DCS sit rip number 18 this year and the sit rip is the new show on all things DCS world related which is the premier combat flight simulator for the home PC if you're tuning in for the first time welcome to the channel this game is brought to you of course by Eagle Dynamics and I'm your host Prickly Hedgehog once again it was a shorter newsletter week short news cycle I guess this week largely I think due to the big patch last week which we had and of course the arrival of the Phantom 2 by Heapler Simulations. ED's newsletter this week focused on a blurb about the INS updates to the F-16C, which was accompanied by a white paper going into a little bit more depth on the modeling of the Vipers, Complex, INS, and GPS systems. According to the newsletter, the team described that the navigation system on the DCS F-16C Viper is a complicated mixture of technical solutions that supplies the navigation avionics with coordinates, velocities, and angles that are characterized by precision, availability, integrity, and autonomy. Very important. This is achieved by the cooperative work of the Inertial Navigation System, or INS, and also the Global Positioning System, GPS, which navigation inputs are processed through a Kalman filter in the modular mission computer, or MMC. Now, I'm not going to dive into the white paper per se, because it's something that we've actually dipped into in previous videos on this channel. And at that time, some people actually questioned whether or not there was a need to get this deep into the modeling of the system for a video game altogether, given that we have flat maps, in game and we don't really have GPS denied environments in any real or meaningful way. This of course would force more reliance on the INS's dead reckoning mechanisms in conjunction with fixed points as described both in the blurb and the the white paper in particular. Now in recent times if you've been paying attention to some of the things going on around in aviation and conflicts that we have there's been a lot of discussion about basically the potency of Russian GPS jamming right now which has played havoc with some western GPS guided weapons and munitions in the Ukraine conflict right now because it reduces their accuracy and therefore their effectiveness notwithstanding a whole lot of other stuff that's going on right now with regards to that. Now while I was researching the Kola map I actually learned that there are similar issues that have cropped up and countered by Finnish commercial pilots, noting that GPS interference has occurred in and around the Kola Peninsula, creating some issues as well. So these particular problems aren't really a factor, at least just yet, in DCS world. And in fairness, too, I think most pilots flying short sorties of less than an hour aren't likely to experience significant drift. So again, some people have questioned whether or not the effort being put into that was really worth it and like a lot of discussions around DCS modules and work on particular systems or features people question whether or not it is injecting its energy in the right direction. It's a fair comment. It remains for me though a really interesting exercise in modeling of a complex system which is capable of error accumulation and correction with manual fix points, although these systems also generate their own discussions as well. So I suspect this may have more legs in a future DCS world in which the global map system is in play, but we're not in a production point where ED is releasing anything more than confirmation that it's actually being worked on. We don't have any uh, tangible evidence of, of what that looks like and how it will work in game, etc., etc. And that, too, is uh, something of some angst for some players, too, asking about whether or not our currently regionalized maps are still going to be effective in the future. ED, right now, as I guess evidence that we're not anywhere close to the global map system, is still producing, along with its third-party teams, lots of standard 
maps, Afghanistan being the first in a lineup of new content coming this month. So we'll have to wait and see what this means for the future of DCS and why they've gone to this level of detail. Remember too that ED does produce things for military contracting as well. So I wonder if this level of detail has more of a commercial application or at least a demonstration of, of their capability of producing highly realistic and detailed modeling of complex systems in order to satiate more than just just the private home PC market. That's my theory. I could be wrong. Nonetheless, I think it's cool. I think uh, GPS and INS uh, systems are, are quite fascinating. I love the way that they are integrated into the aircraft. And ED is not the only team that has done this. Remember that uh, Flying Iron Simulations uh, spend a lot of time discussing the INS work that they're doing on the, on the A7 right now. So stay tuned for more information on this. Okay. Now, while we mention new content, ED plugged a brand new campaign, Operation Mountain Breeze campaign, and this is being produced by Sandman Simulations. It's for the FA-18C Hornet. Now, the blurb here says that in the fall of 2015, the setting for this particular conflict and campaign, the Syrian civil war rages between the rebels and Syrian government forces. The involvement of several foreign powers, such as ISIS and Hezbollah, in the conflict further escalates tensions. On that basis, the USS Theodore Roosevelt's air wing has been tasked to establish a no-fly zone over the western parts of Syria to prevent attacks on civilians. The story-driven campaign places you in the boots of a junior U.S. Navy pilot on the VFA-131 Wildcat Squadron. Your skills as an FA-18C pilot will be tested across 15 challenging missions. You'll receive detailed missions, briefings with charts and kneeboards that can be accessed both in-game and the PDA briefing documents. Detailed briefings are provided by the squadron skipper and flight leads using in-game mission briefings. Cool. Performance-based feedback will be provided after each mission. Voice over narratives between missions, enhance immersion, and create a compelling and varied experience. There's a lot of really cool missions out there right now from the various campaign designers, which I enjoy seeing the professionalism here. So they go on to say that you're going to have to prepare for some intense dogfights, close air support, seed, and strike missions. The skipper apparently has high expectations for you, so hopefully you can meet them. Now, if that sounds like you, as the write-up describes, you'll need both the Hornet and the Syrian map to accompany the campaign. I do enjoy, as I said, the professionalism that's starting to come to a lot of these campaigns right now. Baltic Dragon and Reflected Simulations in particular do raise the bar for this. And so a lot of the other teams that are producing content right now really up their game, which is exciting stuff. South over the ridge. Engage. Come on, now, not covered in this week's newsletter, and definitely something that we need to talk about. I'm sure it's going to come here very, very soon. And that was the flurry of videos from Casmo TV showcasing fundamentals for getting the best out of the Kiowa Warrior. Many of you will likely be aware that Casmo is one of our go to former pilots for content on helicopters as he flew both the Apaches and cut his flying career teeth in the Kiowa Warrior. He flew a slightly earlier variant, he said, than the D that we're going to get in game. Nonetheless, his knowledge on fundamentals is going to be invaluable for those of us also trying to cut our teeth on the virtual version of this fantastic looking aircraft. So thus far, he has discussed and showcased startup procedures, navigation, using the mass mounted sight system for weapon deployment, using the AI system, which you'll need since it is a two person aircraft with integrated crew coordination required to primarily fight with it, the communication system and running and gunning with the 50 cal machine guns, among other commentary and insights on, as I said, a fantastic looking aircraft. Based on what we've seen, as I said, it's looking extremely well prepared. And if we are to believe the release details from Polychop, the release here is imminent in game. It also coincides with the release of the Afghanistan map this month and the Chinook as well. So I'm very, very curious to see the comparisons in things like the AI work that Polychop has done for the Kiowa and also how our ED is going to tackle the crew needs of an aircraft like the Chinook, which remember has a flight crew of three, 
not of course including those door gunners. Now 2024 <laughs> has really got more modules than flies in in Australia in summer and many of us are hearing our wallets groan as we either splurge or we have to make tactical decisions on what we want to buy and fly. There's only so much money to go around and there's only so much time to spend on modules getting to know them. It takes time. Now one quick note on the Kiowa 2 is that this will not be an early access module. Remember the aim here was to make the aircraft mission ready on launch. So that's what we're looking at. But per Casmo's caveat in the intro to the videos, he is flying a pre-release build example. So the final product may differ. I think it's probably fairly accurate if as we know, this is going to be a mission ready helicopter. Obviously there will be adjustments, there will be bugs, there will be things that you know the team um, will need to fix post-launch as thousands of players potentially get to grips with it and are able to provide more feedback. That's very typical of modules. A few content creators too ran into a bug hiccup producing videos, for example, on things like the Phantom 2 recently. This was ironed out in the final product build but to generate some redactions and redo. So these things um, happen with, with modules as uh, more players get their hands on it, run them on different rigs and you know different experiences come through. So yeah, I, I expect good things from this module based on what we are seeing right now. Now, as we mentioned the Phantom 2 community reaction obviously has been very, very positive. Uh, this week post the, the launch. I'm still learning to fly and manage getting used to the flight model and mapping controls, which is typical when you get a brand new module. You've just got to get everything set up and you um, make adjustments on the fly as you become comfortable with it or you you know start using new systems uh, such as weapons. So once I've given it, I guess, more productive seat time, I do intend to produce some videos showcasing my experiences with the aircraft. But for now, I'm really just working on learning to fly the module rather than producing just meaningless videos of, of things I don't really fully understand or I haven't really had a whole lot of time on. Uh, I think that doesn't really do the module justice. I have managed to refuel productively, which I'm very proud of. It's actually not too bad to refuel it. Uh, and I'd like to get you know more proficient in flying it before dabbling into these other skills in a half-assed way. I don't think that does the community any favors and it certainly doesn't do the module any favors. So the other issue I foresee is the arrival too of the aforementioned helicopters which is going to hijack my flight time uh, with the Phantom 2. So it's going to, like I said, there's, there's more modules than flies in an Australian summer here. So it's going to be a challenging time to uh, to really uh, figure out when I'm going to, you know, how I'm going to divvy up my time to enjoy these modules properly. I've also got some vacation time coming up too that's going to uh, take me away from anything to do with DCS actually. So um, we'll make an announcement about that later. I'm really excited about what's coming up for me there. Anyway, um, one thing I have been very impressed with, and that's been flying in VR with the Phantom as well, uh, as expected with a heat blur module. The artwork and the rendering is just spot on, looks fantastic. And VR has been uh, <laughs> such an amazing experience for DCS World for me. So VR is my go-to for flying experiences for DCS World right now. And as most of you know or are aware, I have been using the Pimax Crystal since the beginning of the year. So just under uh, six months here, or maybe just, yeah, just under five months, actually, <laughs> correction. So one of their reps reached out and invited me to attend one of their tour events to the U.S., which uh, my schedule just doesn't allow, I don't think, right now. However, they asked me to remind you all of some of the events that are coming to the U.S., where we can see some of the showcased new hardware. Remember earlier this year, they showcased the, the brand new Crystal Lite, which is a, a pared down version of the, of the Crystal. It doesn't include things like the standalone and the battery has been removed out of it. So they've, they've done some tweaking to cut down some of the extraneous stuff that they felt they didn't need, but also uh, without losing the uh, quality, uh, but it also reduces the price. And the other granddaddy, if you like, of the new products is the, the uh, Crystal Super. So that particular product has a much more um, salubrious and higher fidelity experience than those that have the current Crystal uh, can experience. Uh, obviously, the price bumps up a little bit. So they've got some really neat products right now, about four different products that you can uh, cut your teeth on if you want to just get into it. 
with the crystal light or if you want to splurge a little bit more and spend quite a lot more money then you can go for the for the crystal super as i said which offers you a lot more fidelity now let's look at the dates that the pimax team are talking about here so they will be in london on june 5th in the church street library community space then the show hits the u.s so on june 9th they will be in miami florida at the bath club for two days they will be in the washington dc area at the uh, rush simulator experience and then finally on june 18th and 19th they will be in new york but that venue hasn't been announced just yet so per my previous videos on the Pimax Crystal, I can't go back to 2D now. So I thoroughly recommend if you have the opportunity to uh, you know, get your hands on one of these, maybe you want to check out one of these shows, book your, book your spot and get some hands-on experience with this VR equipment. It is absolutely fantastic. And I, I don't know, I can't praise VR more because it's so cool. The challenge, of course, is that there's quite a lot of different uh, products out there now. And I can't offer you apples to apples comparisons or apples to orange comparisons between different sets if there's a, another manufacturer out there who happens to be listening and wants to send a different kind of set so that we can do those kinds of things um, i'm all ears but uh, uh what i've experienced with the crystal has certainly blown me away and as many of you know they do have some of the highest resolution rates in the business right now it takes a little bit of getting used to a little bit of setup and all the rest of it which we've described in prior videos <laughs> Okay, well that brings us to the end of this week's sip rip. As I said, a shorter news week this week. Do check out the change log, which has a lot of information from last week's big patch. It was pretty extensive, as these big patches often are. Do check out Edie's website for more information. Remember that the Chinook is on sale too in the e-store right now. So don't miss out on that discount if you're intending to pick it up as part of early access, along with the Afghanistan map too, which you can buy in portions depending on your budget. So lots and lots of things to look forward to right now. I can't wait to get into the Kiowa and fly around in Afghanistan and test out the Chinook and also spend some more time with the Phantom too. Thanks to all of you in the community here for the likes, the comments, and the feedback. If you enjoy the content of the channel, don't forget to subscribe. It really helps the channel chug along. Liking and sharing and all the rest of it, that really helps the algorithms uh, keep <laughs> me alive here. Uh, in a very competitive market right now, there's a lot of people wanting to do news. There's a lot of people doing all sorts of interesting content on DCS right now. So stay with me and I appreciate it. I love the loyalty. It really helps, like I said, keep this channel chugging along for a guy who's got uh, limited amounts of time. So stay tuned for more news and information and we'll see you next time on the DCS Syrup. Drifting out. Hey, you're drifting up. Oh, my God.